Now then, let's get some questions that's already been uh, uh, turned in and have, have, these have not yet been answered. Why do we only worship on Sundays and Wednesday when we can worship all week long? Well, I do hope that, uh, that we spend time in devotion to, uh, uh, to that. First of all, why do we worship on Sunday? Look in Acts chapter 20, verse 7, and I love the fact that I didn't have to know what verse it was in because David would be back there on the computer, and I'd say, look in Acts chapter 20, and then David would put on the screen, it's verse 7, and so uh, if I give the wrong verse tonight, just add one or two numbers to it or subtract the one or two numbers from it, you'll be there close. Brother Keeble used to say, just read the whole book, it's in there somewhere. But Acts chapter 20 and verse 7 says, Upon the first day of the week, the disciples came together to break bread. Now, that doesn't say that, uh, you know, that you, that you have to do that. But the Bible does say you must worship God. And since the Bible talks about the fact that it says we must worship God, and then there is a description in, wow, we look at all of these cards we have tonight. Uh, this is great. I'll not get through all of these, I don't think. I hope you haven't loaded it up and given me uh, 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 the same question on every card. That'd be a real interesting night also. Here's another one that's coming in right now. Thank you. Thank you so very much. And I'm just going to shuffle these up because I don't know what's going to be coming in here, and we'll try to, try to deal with them in some order or not. But 1 Corinthians chapter 11, and especially in chapter 12, there's a description of that assembly and what happened in that assembly. And the Bible talks about in chapter 11, there was the Lord's Supper. In fact, 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 33 and 34, talks about the fact that you come together to eat. That's rather interesting. You come together to eat. And he is rebuking them. You go back to about verse 20, he says, uh, shall I praise you in what you're doing? He said, I'm not going to praise you in what you're doing. You're, you're not eating the Lord's Supper the verse says, you are eating your own supper. And so they were coming together, set aside the Lord's Supper, and had changed the Lord's Supper in such a way that it had become their own supper. And that's why, and we often read 1 Corinthians chapter 11 on Sunday morning before the Lord's Supper, where Paul says, here's the way you do it. I received the Lord the very, very night that I was betrayed, how he took the bread and he took the cup. You remember all of that? Now, when he, after he discusses the Lord's Supper, he then says in verse 33 and 34, when you come together to eat, why did they come together? Well, Acts 20 and verse 7 says, they came together to eat the Lord's Supper. Now, put these two verses together. You come together to eat. 1 Corinthians chapter 16. 1 Corinthians chapter 16 says, here's the orders that I've given to the churches, not just to you, not a local thing, but even to the churches of Galatia, 700 miles away, here's what you do upon the first day of the week. It doesn't say come together to give, but it says upon the first day of the week, let every one of you lay by in store as God has prospered him. They didn't come together to give, but while they were together, they were together, they were to give. That's why in our worship we have giving. Why? We, we're, we're doing what they said. The church has needs. And that's the way the church, but let me point out something, and if you've got a, a, a newer translation, probably not the King James, but a, a newer translation than that would say, because it's what the Greek says, upon the first day of every week. Underline in your mind that word every. It's critical to get that. 1 Corinthians eleven thirty three says, you come together to eat. How often did they come together? 1 Corinthians chapter 16, verse 2 says, they came together every week. Why did they come together? To eat the Lord's Supper. When did they come together? On the first day of every week. And so that's why we worship on Sunday. It's called what the Lord told us to. Now, why do we meet on Wednesday night? Well, it's a part of the food that we need. I'm not sure where Wednesday night services started. There are some congregations, one of the congregations in this town that meets on Tuesday night instead of, instead of on a Church of Christ that meets on Tuesday night and instead of on a Wednesday night. Why do, you, why do we do that? Because we need the spiritual food. And some of the best classes that we have and more in-depth classes that we have in this church are Wednesday night classes. Where does that come from? The Bible tells the elders of the church to feed the flock. 
And our elders, in their wisdom, have said, it's a long way from one Sunday to another. Why don't we come together in the middle of the week just so that the edification that we receive from being together, why do not we come together in the middle of the week just to do that? Now then, could you do that every week? Yes, it might be very difficult if you've got jobs, if you've got children, young people, if you have homework, you understand what I'm talking about? It, there might be a problem in relationship to that. When the church began in Acts chapter 2, the Bible says, and daily in the temple. When the church began, they enjoyed learning the apostles' doctrine because Acts 2.42 says they continued in the apostles' doctrine and, and uh, verse 46 and, and 47 talks about they came together every day. Well, how on earth could you do that? They had come there for a Jewish feast day. They didn't have to go to work the next Sunday, the next Monday, or the, you know. They were there, and they'd come for that Jewish feast day, and it was very feasible for them to come together in relationship to that. There was a denominational group in New Zealand, uh, uh, and they met 7 o'clock every morning. It was an unusual thing. But imagine starting every day just uh, with a prayer with your brethren, with your saints and everything. You don't have to do it. Why do we do it? Well, why, why do we eat the Lord's Supper every Sunday? That's why we do it. Why do we do it on Wednesday night? For the same reason we have a, a 9 o'clock Bible classes. Elders are trying to feed us, and that's why, that's why we come together. I think it is interesting, but perhaps it ought to be said, that we need to keep in mind the fact that, that those who have partaken of the Lord's Supper tonight have done exactly what the Bible said upon the first day of the week you come together to break bread. And that's one of the reasons we make in our Sunday night services, instead of taking them out to a classroom somewhere, that we have communion together. We have communion literally by all of us eating the same bread, and in our hearts and our soul, we had communion tonight with those individuals who came together on the first day of the week later in the day. Here's a great one, great question. Who created God? I know the answers to that. Now listen, I'm going to tell you who created God. And uh, now, uh, well, if I tell you who created God, that's not going to solve the problem. Because if I tell you tonight who created God, you will have another question. Who created the who that created God? Now, I know the answer to that. But if I tell you who created the who that created God, and you've got that information, you'd still have another question. Who created the who that created the who that created the who that created God? And then you got another question. Who created the who that 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 created, created God? You know, I, I know that in our finite mind, you understand that? You know what infinity is? I'm not talking about the TV or the, the, uh, uh, the network. I'm not talking about the wireless, not that kind of infinity. You know that little mark in math, that little eight that's on its side, and, and you take it, and that's the mark in math that says it just goes on and on and on and on. That's a visible picture of what infinity is. In our finite mind, everything has a starting place and a beginning place. Let me tell you about God. The Bible says, Psalms chapter 90, I believe it's verse 2, from eternity to eternity, thou art God. Where was God before, in the beginning, He created the heavens and the earth? You see, it's only whenever the heavens and the earth are created that we have a measurement of time in a finite way. The evening and the morning were the first day. Day one, evening and morning. Day two, evening and morning. And there have been a lot of evenings and mornings since all of, all of that time but the Bible says that go back before there ever was time. Go back before there ever was a world. And what you'll see back there is, and get this, the eternal God. This is not uh, 
and, and understanding that that comes from, from some theologian. It goes at least, it, 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 it finds in writing its inception in Greek philosophy. Something is, therefore something eternally was. The very fact that this world exists says that before there existed this world, there was something before that. And that, you go back far enough, and that which is something is eternity. And living in eternity, from eternity that was there before there was the first day, to the eternity that there will be when there is the last day, when there's no more evenings and mornings. Go beyond that. What's on the other end? Eternity. And I love Psalms chapter 90 verse 2, that, that you, have it in, you, you inhabit eternity from eternity to eternity. Thou art God. So God's not a created being. He is the creator, okay? Here's an interesting one. What is meant by the new heavens and the new earth? Well, that is not uh, uh, just an expression that you begin to read somewhere in the New Testament. In the Old Testament, there's a description in the book of Isaiah. As you get to that messianic section we've talked about, in that Wednesday night class where we're studying, studying the book of Isaiah, that the last half of the book of Isaiah is filled with that which is messianic. And so when you, when you get over, uh, over there into that part, you'll begin reading about the fact that the Lord is, has something wonderful and good in mind. And as he describes... That which is good and wonderful in mind, he begins describing what the church is. Look in Isaiah chapter 62, starting uh, before we get to the new heavens and, and the new earth a little bit later. But Isaiah chapter 62, For Zion's sake I will not hold my peace, and for Jerusalem's sake I will not rest, until her righteousness goes forth, as brightness and salvation burns as a lamp that uh, bur salvation burns as a lamp, salvation as a lamp that burns. The Gentiles shall see your righteousness, and you shall be called by a new name. You need to mark down Isaiah chapter sixty-two, verse two. That nation already had a name. They were the Israelites. They were the children of Israel. The word Israel means one who has power with God. And so the first Israel there was, was Jacob. And God changed Jacob's name to Israel. But his descendants were given that name because they were the ones who had power with God. Gentiles were not included in this. If you were not a descendant of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob... You were not an Israelite. We use the expression Jew to refer to them because that name comes from the fact they lived evidently in Judea. And so, uh, but their, their name was Israelites, those who have power with God. But in Isaiah chapter 62, verse 2, he talks about the time when Christianity is going to come. And the Gentiles would see the righteousness of God and a new name would be given. What is that new name that is a part of the New Testament? It's not found in Acts 2. In Acts 2, when the church began, there were only Jews in the church. You've got to get to Acts chapter 11, verse 26. And when you get to Isaiah chapter 11 and verse 26, you will arrive at that place where the Gentiles have come in and the disciples were called Christians first at Antioch. Why Antioch? Because most of those in the church at Antioch were Gentiles. And the prophet had said in the Old Testament, God is about to really, really do some amazing new things. 
And so whenever you get over to Isaiah chapter uh, 65 and 66, you run across, and David will have to tell me the verse where that's found, where uh, uh, you begin reading about the word of the Lord and the fact that there will be a new heaven and a new earth. What verse is that? 17. Is that 65 or 67? 65, 17. See, I need him back there on the computer. Now, David's not that much smarter than I am. He is smarter than I am. I give you that. But see, he sits back at that computer, and he can look up every bit of this. And for the last 20 years in this building, David and I have had a contest. He's trying to guess what verse I'm going to do. And, and he's back there. He's, he's trying to read my mind and what I'm saying so that the very time I say, he throws the verse up. And he is so good at that. And, you know, I thought he knew every verse in the Bible. But, uh, but I've, then it suddenly dawned on me he's got a computer. But look in verse, uh, uh, verse 17. In verse 17 of chapter 65, there is a description of the fulfillment of the things that were going to transpire when the church began. And I want you to hear what that description is. He says, and I wish we had time to read all, all, of, read all of this chapter, but he says, For behold, I create a new heaven and a new earth, and the former things shall be uh, shall not be remembered or come to mind. Be glad and rejoice forever in what I create. For behold, I create Jerusalem as a rejoicing place, and her people as a joy. I will rejoice in Jerusalem and joy in my people. The voice of weeping shall no longer be heard, nor the voice of crying. No man, no more shall an infant from there live but a few days, nor is an old man be full, uh, who has not fooled his days. For the child shall die at 100, and the sinner being 100 years old shall be accursed. What's he talking about? It's in that messianic chapter. And in that messianic chapter, he says, here's what's going to happen. All of the former things are passed away. If you lived in the days of Isaiah, and you were there, and you were a part of those things that were a part of Judaism, those are the current things. But when that time arrives, when that time arrives, that the Gentiles are brought in, those Old Testament things that were centered around physical Jerusalem were going to end. And figuratively, instead of there being old Jerusalem and there being that old heaven and earth, that old arrangement of things, there would be that new arrangements of things. And so when you get over to chapter 65, 66, you, can, you, can, you, can, you continue to read this. Look in verse 22. For as the new heavens and the earth which I will make shall remain before me, so shall your descendants and your name remain. And it shall come to pass that from one new moon to another and from one Sabbath to another, all flesh shall come to worship before me, says the Lord. How is that going to happen? When's that going to happen? Listen to Isaiah back in Isaiah chapter 2. In Isaiah chapter 2, he says, in the last days, whenever all of these old things are ending, when a new arrangement of things are about to come about, in the last days, he says, the mountain of the Lord's house shall be, shall be established in the top of the mountain. What is the house of the Lord? Does not 1 Timothy chapter 3 verse 15 says, I write these things to young Timothy that you might know how you ought to behave yourself in the house of God, which is the church of the living God. So back in Isaiah chapter 2, he's prophesying about that messianic age. And he says, when that messianic age comes, that the house of the Lord will be established in the tallest mountains and all nations shall flow unto it. 
And then he makes this statement. For out of Jerusalem shall go forth the law and the word of the Lord from Jerusalem. Now let's put it all together. Under Judaism, there was that old system of Judaism. There was that old way of worshiping. It was only Jewish. It had Jewish feast days. It had the Jewish priesthood. It had the Jewish law. But he says, I'm going to bring about something that's new and something that is remarkable. And that which is new and that which is, mar which is remarkable is going to be established. And figuratively, it's a new heaven and a new earth because the former things have passed away and I will delight in Jerusalem. Why? Because the word of the Lord will go forth from Jerusalem. And so Isaiah chapter 2 says that the mountain of the Lord's house, the house of the Lord will be established in the top of the mountains. And nations shall come unto it. All nations shall flow into it. Do you know what happened when the church started? You know where it started? It started in Jerusalem. You know what happened when that fountain was opened in Jerusalem for sin and for uncleanliness? Zechariah chapter 13 verse 2. The whole nations, the whole world found refuge in God, not in that old system of things, but in that new system of things that is described as the new heavens and the new earth. And so he says, look again at verse 22, For as the new heavens and the earth which I will make shall remain before me, says the Lord, your descendants and your name shall remain, and it shall come to pass from month to month and week unto week, all flesh shall come to worship before me. Isn't that the nature of Christianity? Not just Jewish flesh, Jewish and Gentile flesh. And, if you get, and, and Joel chapter 2 says, I'll pour out my spirit upon all flesh. They were told to go in the world and preach the gospel to every creature. Where'd that message come, came, come from? It came from Jerusalem. And that new heaven and that new earth were to, were to, was to begin whenever the former things passed away and the new name was given. And so the Bible talks about a new heaven and a new earth. And when Isaiah talks about a new heaven and a new earth, he is talking about the beginning of Christianity and the spread of Christianity. And so in this chapter, you'll read about the fact that uh, uh, they shall go forth and, and, and look upon the carcasses of the men who have transgressed against me, for the worm shall not die. What's that all about? Well, I'll tell you exactly what it's all about. Whenever the judgment of God came against Jerusalem, there were corpses all around, corpses all the way. There were corpses all around, uh, uh, all over the place. You know, 1.1 million Jews died whenever Jerusalem was destroyed. Jerusalem is no more. What is that new system of things? That new heaven and that new earth is what is there. There's a whole lot more that can be said about that. And so, if, you know, if there's something more you want to know about that, ask another question next time we do this, and, and we will begin to look at that. Um, why do humans believe that monkeys uh, turn into men, I think, I think it says, turn into men? Uh, well... I don't want to be sarcastic and rude about this. But the Bible says, when you do not know God, Romans chapter 1, when they knew God, they did not glorify God. Romans chapter 1 says, they are without excuse. Verse 20 says, that from the creation of the world, they can know that there's a God who has eternal power and who has deity. But then he says, let me tell you what happened. Starting in verse 21, when they knew God, they glorified him not as God. They weren't thankful. And they became foolish in their reasoning. How on earth 
can anyone believe that uh, that that which uh, always produces after its kind could produce a new kind? The same people that believe that the ancestors of the ape and the ancestor of the human is some animal that was up there and that had both of these characteristics and so that it split and so we got apes and we got humans. You know what they also believe? That cats and dogs came. That at one time, there were, before there ever was a cat, before there ever there was a dog, there was a, 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 a dat and a cog because it had within it the ability to be one or the other. You know what dogs produce? Do you know that Genesis 1 over and over and over again says, after its kind, after its kind. And so why do people believe that? Because once I admit there is a God, a supreme being, listen to this, whenever I acknowledge that there's some power greater than me, when I acknowledge that that power exists, then by the very process of reasoning, that says, I am accountable to him. And if you don't want to make yourself accountable to God, then you need to convince everybody that all a human being is, is an animal. And the difference between you and an ape is you have a thumb and he doesn't have it, and you are, for all intents and purposes, a hairless ape. Let us make man in our image. And the Lord God breathed into that clay the breath of life, and man became a living soul in the image of God. You let us take God and change God into the image of a man. We got it upside down. The whole nature is for us to be made in the image of God. One final question. Oh, man, I wish I had time to d deal with all of these. If Jesus or God is real, why are there so many awful things happening in the world? Need to get this. Why do little babies die? Why does that happen? Where does death come from? Where does cancer come from? Where does disease come from? Where does getting old and decrepit come from? It wasn't that way when God created a beautiful garden where there was access to the tree of life and eating of the tree of life would give one life forever. But when sin entered into this world, God wanted us to understand the very nature, the very nature of what sin is like and how wretched it is. And he put within our world a reminder of that. Well, why didn't God just make us all good? God could have made you a robot Christian. A Christian is a being, and it happens every Sunday to every creature God puts on this earth. And on Sunday morning, they all wake up at 8 o'clock. They brush their teeth, they comb their hair, they put on their best clothes, and they robotically come in, and they say perfect prayers, and they sing perfect songs, and never hit a discordant note, and, and they eat the Lord's Supper, and they're so focused, they never mind never drifts at all or anything. But when God gave Adam and Eve the ability to choose evil, there are consequences to doing wrong. And when you talk about the awful things that happen in this world, those things we talk about like disease, 
Where does that come from? It comes as a result of the sin of Adam and Eve. That's why little babies die. Not because the baby's a sinner, but because there is death into this world and those individuals, Adam and Eve, separated from the tree of life, they died. And the world is cursed. And now the world that is outside the created world now has thorns in it. It has the ability for evil people to be in the world. And so here's Cain killing his brother. You know, as you read the account, maybe the only four people were on this earth. I don't know. The Bible said Adam had sons and daughters in Genesis chapter 5. But when there were four people on this earth, as far as those whose names we know, one of them killed another one. Where does that evil thing come from? That evil thing comes from the evil of a man that has freedom of choice. In this world, this world is cursed because of the sin of Adam and Eve. And so death is a result not of the sin of a little child, but separated from the tree of life, there is death. There is disease. There is getting old. There is infirmities of every different kind. Not uh, that it's brought about by our own sins, but when Adam and Eve sinned, this world was opened up for there to be evil. And you and I need to understand that it was not that way in the beginning. Every unhappiness, listen, every unhappiness in this world is caused by sin. Either your sin, the sin of those around you, or the sin of Adam and Eve. Where does evil come from? Not from God. When God makes a world, it's perfect. But when sin enters in the world, the world is cursed. We still have freedom of choice. And since God has not made us all little robots to walk around and never say a curse word and never do anything wrong, there are evil people in the world just like there's evil Cain in this world who killed his brother. And that same kind of thing is happening in our day. Let me conclude by saying it this way. There's a world that has joy in it even the worst of times. Count it all joy when you have troubles in your life. Why? Knowing this, that adversity makes you to be stronger. The trying of your faith brings about patience. James chapter 1, verse 5 and 6 says, be happy when there is adversity because it will make you to be a stronger person. But God has made it possible for us in the midst of the world that's filled with that which people who do not understand sees the world as a miserable place. But that which sometimes is seen as a miserable place is one of the greatest blessings. There is a blessing that comes from the adversity in your life. Maybe I could say it this way. What is the worst day that Peter ever had? What's the worst day that Peter ever lived? When he's cursing and swearing and saying, I don't know Jesus. Back away from that long enough to understand the worst day that Peter had is the best day he ever had. Because the result of the worst day that Peter ha ever had brought about salvation to Peter's soul by the death of Jesus. And so when there's evil in the world, recognize that God will sustain us as we go through that evil and he will bless us and take care of us. Are you ready to go through life? You want to be happy? I'm talking about being filled 
not with giddy happiness like you'd have whenever somebody gives you a free give, gives you uh, tickets to Disney. You want to be happy? You want to have joy? Find the joy of being forgiven of your sins and being a faithful Christian. The happiest people on this earth are faithful Christians. They suffer like everybody else, but they find joy in all that happens. If you're not a Christian, you need to be. You need to obey the gospel so that you can become his child. What do you mean by obey the gospel? I mean, you just do what this book tells you to do in order to become a child of God. It's not some prayer that you say. He became the author of eternal salvation, Hebrews chapter 5 and verse 8, to all that obey him. If you'll obey him tonight, he'll bring your salvation and all the joy that you have when you have the joy of salvation. You want to obey him tonight? Have you obeyed what he says about believing in him? I hope you have. I hope you believe in him. I hope you're not some individual that thinks that man is a product of apes. I'm not, I don't, not, I hope you believe that he's created by God. Have you changed your life? That's called repentance. And the Bible says, except you repent, you'll perish. You'd believe in him, know the story, know the story of the crucifixion, know the story of Peter's denial and all the rest. But you need, you need to change your life. And except you repent, Jesus said, you will perish. But having done that, once you let people know that you believe Jesus is the Son of God, this very night, you could be immersed in water in the very death of Jesus. Romans chapter 6 verse 4 says we're baptized into his death. That's where his blood is found. And when you're baptized into his death, the blood of Jesus will wash away your sins. Have you done that? Will you not find the joy of salvation? If you're a child of God who's wandered away and needs to come home, you know what you need to do. How can we help you deal with sin? Won't you let it be known by coming to the front right now as together we stand and as we sing.